the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. And we will be there in just a little bit, focusing in on verse number 8. This particular study is, once again, in answer to a question. I am sorry to say that the one who asked it uh, is not here. But uh, that's the way it is uh, sometimes. Uh, I, I think the devil especially fights to keep people away from the truth, especially the truth illustrated. And that's what um, our ministry is all about. Not just simply to speak some words and have people forget it, but to have it indelibly printed, embedded in your mind so that you don't forget. Now the question arises with regard to some modern day practices. The Pentecostals and the Charismatics practice certain things like speaking in tongues, being slain in the spirit, mass slayings in the spirit, where whole sections of an audience will fall over, uh, frothing at the mouth uh, in convulsions uh, and so forth at the beck and command of some man who claims to be a servant of God. And then there are the groups who believe that one's sensibilities are always kept under the filling of the Holy Spirit, that you do not lose consciousness, and that though your emotions might respond in warm appreciation to the truth, they never revolt against your volition so that they take charge of your soul rather than you having control of your soul. Now, much of this comes from the fact that the Charismatics and the Pentecostals mix the programs of God. As you know, we have here the two main dispensations as far as we're concerned. The others are important, but these two actually form the bodies into which believers are placed. That's why they're so special. Under law, the nation of Israel, or you could even say, and here's where some of the confusion comes, the church or the congregation of Israel. See, Israel has a church. Uh, when it says in Acts chapter 2 that the Lord added to the church, and they say, well, see, that there's the church right there. And we would say, yes, but what church is it? It's the church of Israel. Uh, and uh, the church me simply meaning the same Greek word is used, ekklesia, the assembly. The context must determine which church it is. So you have the church or the nation of Israel, and you have the church, which is his body. Now that's the second group. Under the dispensation of grace, uh, the organization into which one is placed as a believer is different than the nation of Israel. Now it would, it would be uh, quite uh, an amazing thing for God to take one who is a member of the church, who is neither Jew nor Gentile, and making him a, a member of the nation of Israel, where racial distinctives are a priority. Being a child of Abraham, being a Jew, and being connected to his covenant is absolutely essential. So you have to make dispensational differences. Now, their problem is they mix them and make the church not national Israel, but spiritual Israel, as we've said many, many times before. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that there are some things that connect us. Jesus Christ and his cross provided a common salvation for us. He provides eternal life for both groups. We have a hope of living with God in eternity with both groups. But from that point onward, there is not much that connects us. There are differences. The nation of Israel has the earth as its destiny. The church has the third heaven. And on and on we could go. They're blessed with all earthly blessings in earthly places. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So uh, there are differences. But now there is something that does connect us. 
And we're going to talk about the, that in just a little bit, but I'm going to put the letters NC up here for the new covenant. There is one aspect of a covenant given to the nation of Israel. The salvation clause that is transferred to the church. The same blood of the new covenant, which was shed on the cross, is the same blood that saves us. The difference is God made a covenant with Israel that he would send that blood for us poor Gentiles, he, he promised it to us by grace. He allows us to participate in what we'll call, we'll call it theologically, the salvific work of Jesus Christ on the cross by grace. He did not make that covenant with us, but yet he allows us the privileges afforded by the blood. And that's important. Okay, now. Many people do not understand that Underneath the dispensation of law, therefore, there is a baptism. Israel's new covenant provided a baptism. Now, we already know there's a water baptism. But there is another baptism that the new covenant provides that we're going to see this evening. Now, the interesting thing about this is that right here we have on the left side uh, of the screen, Jesus Christ being the baptizer. Now this is always important because in order to dispel the confusion of this so-called being slain in the spirit and talking in tongues, being baptized with the Holy Spirit, you have to understand who is the baptizer, who is being baptized, and into whom the believer is placed, the one being baptized uh, is placed. So we're going to see verses of Scripture that designate Jesus Christ as the baptizer, a believer under law, so either Jew or Gentile could be uh, baptized, and the element. Now who is the element here but God the Holy Spirit? Note verse 8. John the Baptist is talking. I, John the Baptist, indeed have baptized you with water. Now that's one of the interesting things about Israel under law. Remember that the new covenant will not be totally fulfilled until the millennial kingdom. So there is a transition. Uh, and, and as long as there is uh, a token there of, uh, in the transition, you have a mixture of both. What's that? Well, the new covenant said they'd be baptized into the Holy Spirit, but it always followed what other baptism? Water. It was water than spirit. Water than spirit. Always. So uh, there is the formula. You believe, you are water baptized, and you are then given the gift of the Holy Spirit according to the new covenant. But he, Jesus Christ, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Okay, let's turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse number 33. I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now, one of the reasons that I have these three illustrations all on one slide is because I want you to see that even Jesus Christ himself set a precedent. His first body that was born on Christmas Day, his first body was baptized with what? The Holy Spirit. Right there it says, unto whom that you'll see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. All right? That is, according to the new covenant, the baptism of or with the Holy Spirit. So this body was placed, first of all, this is John uh, chapter 1, verse 33. Jesus Christ himself was placed into this element. He set the precedent. 
Once he was filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized within the sphere of the power of the Holy Spirit, that's how he lived his life, from that point on, he baptizes the believer into the realm of the Holy Spirit. But what believer? Only those believers under the dispensation of law. Grace believers are not placed into the Holy Spirit. Now, they have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is not around them. Now, would you say that if Jesus Christ is placed into or baptized into the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is around him? Absolutely. Just like all the other Old Testament saints. And by the way, was Jesus Christ an Old Testament saint? Yes, he was. He was born under what dispensation? Law. He was an Old Testament saint. Uh, he, in effect, started the New Testament, but the New Covenant or Testament will not be totally or completely fulfilled until the Millennial Kingdom. Then and then only are all of the ramifications of the New Covenant given, it, given to Israel. What he was doing here was simply giving token portions of it to show that the kingdom was coming. So that is why there is a mix of both water baptism first, which is part of the old covenant, and, and Holy Spirit baptism second, which is part of the new covenant. So uh, there is that. Now, while we're here, therefore, let's go back to the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah. 31 is the chapter, and 31 is the verse. Hundreds of years after Moses ratified the old covenant with Israel, Jeremiah, another prophet of Israel, says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now search as you will. What word is missing there? Gentile. It doesn't say I'm going to make a new covenant with the Gentiles, with Israel, period. Gentiles can benefit, but only as they become religiously Jews. That's how they get saved. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand out of Egypt, which covenant they break. But this shall be the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel. Now you'll note the word house there. It's very important because when Jesus Christ actually sent the Spirit the first time, where were they? in the upper room of a what? Of a house. The house indicates a dynasty, a family, the house of David, the seed of David, his, um, his um, dynasty, in other words, or going all the way back to the family of Abraham. God is going to literally baptize all saved Jews with the Holy Spirit, according to the new covenant. I will put my law in their inward parts, write it on their hearts, I'll be their God, and so forth. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, they shall all know me. All right, let's go to chapter 32. You're going to have to follow along because it's, it is comparing Scripture with Scripture here that we finally begin to see that God does something with Israel that He doesn't do with us. He puts the Holy Spirit in them and on them. Okay, let's continue to read. Chapter 32, verse 37. Behold, I'll gather them out of all countries. You see, he can't do that with the Gentiles. We are already in our homeland. But the Jewish homeland is Israel. He gathers them out of Gentile territories and brings them back home. It's when they're home that he baptizes their house with the Holy Spirit. All right? 
I'll bring them to this place. They shall be my people. I'll be their God. I'll give them one heart and one way. They'll fear me forever uh, for the good of them and their children. And I'll make an everlasting covenant with them and will not turn away from them to do them good. All right. Now let's begin looking through the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 11. Ezekiel chapter 11 and starting with verse 19. All right, now, here is one of the aspects of the new covenant that we share in common. If they get saved, what happens to them? Their human spirit gets regenerated. And it's God the Holy Spirit who does that. And he gives us eternal life as them. I've given to them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. And I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. In other words, it's going to be as it was originally created in Adam. They're born again. That's what this is talking about. That they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances. Well, now, how in the world are they going to be able to walk in God's statutes? When they're, they too have sinful flesh. Well, here's how they do it. The dynamics of their spirituality is somewhat different than ours. Ours are mainly internal. Theirs are external. Let's go to chapter 36 in Ezekiel. Chapter 36. And starting with verse 26. Now, we're going to begin to see a difference here. And it's in the word cause. God, the Holy Spirit, because he is surrounding them, um, is going to more or less give them um, a supernatural ability. Uh, we've all heard of the bionic man and the bionic woman and so forth. And they were able to do supernatural things. Well, God, the Holy Spirit is enveloping them on the outside. When Samson had the spirit of God to envelop him, what did he do? He killed a thousand soldiers with the jawbone of an ass with his right hand. Hey, that's not too bad. Uh, and on and on we could go with people who had the spirit of God to fall upon them. The point is, with the new covenant, the Spirit of God is going to stay on them in the millennial kingdom. All right? Now, let's read verse 26. A new heart I'll give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a new heart of flesh, regenerated and, and sealed. I will put my spirit within you, okay? And now we begin to see the outer part and cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgment so you'll dwell in the land. That word cause is going to show us there's something now external. I will keep following with me to chapter uh, 37. Behold, I'll cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. I'll lay sinews upon you, and I'll put breath in you, and ye shall live. Now, what is going to happen whenever they live? These bones literally are going to come up out of the graves. And the wind, verse number 10, So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath came on them, and they lived and stood upon their feet. Now, it's the breath of God that is going to give them life within and power without. Verse 14, I shall put my spirit in you and you'll live. All right, keep following. Chapter 39, verse 28. Now, how is this possible that God will cause them to obey his law? Because they now have what we call a dynamic of spirituality, uh, a supernatural, bionics, an uh, extranatural, preternatural power. 
Verse 28, they shall know that I am the Lord, which caused them to be led into captivity. I've gathered them to their own land. They're not going to leave anymore. Why? Because they're not going to sin anymore. Neither will I hide my face from them anymore. For I have, and here's the key, poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel. I put him within and I put him outside of, of Israel excuse me, outside of their bodies. Turn with me now to the book of Joel, chapter 2. The book of Joel. The book of Joel, chapter 2. Now here is... The significance, therefore, of what's going to happen on the day of Pentecost. What? God is going to put a new heart in them. That's their salvation. But he's going to give them a new power outside of them to cause them to keep the law. Jesus Christ is going to baptize them into the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who enables them to live and walk virtually a perfect life. Verse number 28. Joel 2, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions and also your servants and your handmaids I'll pour out of my spirit. Okay, now you have to understand that Joel says this happens afterward. After what? Notice the last part of verse 31. Uh, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. In other words, there's going to come a time when, in a token fashion, God is going to give them this. Joel will be fulfilled. But the total prophecy of Joel will not be fulfilled until afterward. So there is a, a temporary or a smaller literal fulfillment of Joel. And then there is the broadest fulfillment. All flesh alive on planet Earth is going to be baptized in the Spirit. Why is that? After the great and terrible day of the Lord, who is left on the Earth? Only believers are left physically alive. Believers who stay true and didn't take the mark of the beast, are they qualified to get the filling of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. But not only in them, but on them. Now, how do we know? Turn to Acts chapter 1. Actually, let's go to Luke 24, first of all. Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, 49. Now, we could go through the book of John as well, where Jesus Christ talked about the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going away, but I'm going to send to you the promise of my Father. Where did the Father promise the Holy Spirit in them and on them? We just read it. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Joel and others talk about in them and pouring it out on them, being able to have a new heart within and then the power of the spirit without to live the Christian way of life. That's why Jesus Christ came baptizing all of them into the Holy Spirit. He was fulfilling the new covenant to Israel. But that's one aspect that we do not have because we are not Jewish flesh. We have to be Jews to have that or Gentiles saved under law. They too will participate in that, but it's only as they come through Israel are they baptized into the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. Get that on you. The spirit is on you, not just in, but on. Tarry ye here in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Here is our doctrine of endowment. Up until this point, believers had the Holy Spirit to come on them. And remember David, he, he prayed, take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
But in this particular case, once the new covenant is here in the millennium, for those certain believers, the Holy Spirit's going to give them the power to live perfectly, the Christian way of life as it is for them at that time. Okay, Acts. Acts chapter 1. Jesus Christ talking in verse number 5. Now, please remember, these verses of Scripture virtually are, uh, are an impossibility for us to fulfill. They're not for us. Now, we should study them, sure. But uh, you're, you're not going to uh, be one of them placed in the Holy Spirit. John truly baptized with water. Ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Jesus said this. Water, then baptism. I'll put you in the Holy Spirit. So stay in Jerusalem. I'll send you the promise of the Father. Verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come where? In you? No. They were already saved. But according to the new covenant, Jesus Christ would place the Holy Spirit on them. So, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, verse number one of chapter two, they were with all one accord of one place. A sound came from heaven as a mighty rushing wind. That's Ezekiel chapter 37. He breathes on them life and they live. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues. So what did everybody say? What's going on here? And what did Peter say? Verse 16, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It'll come to pass in the last days I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Verse 18, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. Now, the pour, pouring out of the Holy Spirit does not happen in the dispensation of grace. It is a basic tenet under law according to the new covenant to Israel. They were given power before the tribulation period to live through it, and they will be given total power after the battle of Armageddon and the establishment of the kingdom to have ecstatics and to, and to keep the law of God in the millennium. All right, now let's, um, let's look at verse number 33 in the same chapter. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted. Remember in John chapter 7, Jesus said, If any man believes on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He spake of the Holy Ghost, which was not yet given, says verse 39, because Jesus was not yet what? Glorified. Jesus wasn't glorified. But Jesus said in John 14, 15, and 16, If I go away, I'll pray the Father, he'll send you another comforter. And when he has come, he'll bring all things to your memory, whatsoever I've taught you. He's the one that will give you power. That's what he's saying. Stay in Jerusalem till you receive power. The promise of my Father is power. Where did he promise it? New covenant. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, the promise of the Holy Ghost, the gift of the Holy Ghost, baptism with the Holy Ghost, all of those things are for Israel under the new covenant. They have nothing whatsoever to do with us today. So my, my conclusion is this. Those that are speaking with tongues are number one, either lying, Number two, either manipulating their emotions. Number three, are demon-possessed. It's one of the three. It has to be. They're either faking it for the approval of the others in the congregation. They're manipulating their emotions so that they feel good, as we contend it's sex in the soul. Or thirdly, they're being um, demon-obsessed. Okay, now we've said all that to say this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In the dispensation of grace, we'll go back to uh, we'll go back to ver uh, chapter eleven first. In the dispensation of grace, the dynamic is different. The Holy Spirit is given within, but the emphasis is on the internal filling of the Spirit. That's why we emphasize academics here. Why? Because it's the inner dynamics of the Spirit and the Word that give you victory. 
You don't have God the Holy Spirit coming on you so that you can punch your enemy in the nose, you know, and get rid of him. You can't do that. But you can defeat your enemy. But because it's different, the one body of Jesus Christ is outside of his deity. It's connected so that it indeed is a divine body as such, but it's still human. It is outside of his deity. But the second body of, of Jesus Christ is placed in him. We are actually allowed the, the spiritual blessings before the foundation of the world. What, what existed before the foundation of the world? Nothing but God. So if we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ before the foundation of the world, we are blessed with a privilege of being allowed to actually enter deity itself. That doesn't make us God, but it allows us to have the dynamics of the spirituality of Jesus Christ as he existed before the foundation of the world, before he became a man. Now, as somebody would say, well now, if, how can man be placed in deity? I just showed you Jesus Christ places the believer in the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit God? Absolutely. Does the Holy Spirit give power to men to live the Christian way of life by being on them? Absolutely. And they in him? Oh, yes. But it's, it's reverse. Instead of Jesus Christ placing the believer now into the Holy Spirit's deity for successful Christian living... <laughs> The Holy Spirit places the believer in grace into Jesus Christ, forming the second body of Christ, but more importantly for us, uh, uh, allowing us um, uh, the, a, a different dynamic. Okay, now let's see. I've got to get the right color pen here. So uh, the Holy Spirit then takes us and seals us in Christ. Now you see the, the absolute reversal. Talk about an operation flip-flop. I wish I could teach the charismatics this, this truth here. It revolutionized their thinking. But, but as long as they want to start the church in Acts 2 and talk in tongues, they're never going to see this, this business. And this is more important. The Holy Spirit takes the believer and he seals him in Christ. And so he is the seal that we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who guarantees our security in him. Now, what, as I said, there is a connection. What is that connection? The one aspect of the new covenant that is common to both groups, not the land aspect, our, our destiny is the third heaven, not the race aspect, we're neither Jew nor Gentile. On and on we could go. No aspect of the new covenant is ours except one, the salvation clause. And uh, by the way, this is not the Santa clause, nor his wife, B clause. I always like to say that. Just be clause. Okay. Right. Actually, it doesn't make any sense, but it sounds good. Verse 23. I have received of the Lord that which I delivered to you. That night, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it and distributed it. He said this to him in remembrance of me. He took the cup. And he said the same thing. Last part of verse 25, drink it in remembrance of me. But you'll note what the Apostle Paul says. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. And Jesus Christ said that my blood is shed for the remission of what? Sins. That is the aspect. That is the common denominator. We participate in the blood of the new covenant. All else does not pertain, but that pertains. That's why we celebrate the Lord's table, not just as a memorial for his death, but we participate in something that is so great. The new covenant given to Israel without ever God promising it to us. God says, OK, I'm going to take that blood and you can participate in its forgiveness. Now, there are some groups within the grace uh, um, uh, circles that do not believe in the Lord's Supper, that it was totally for Israel. That's not true. You'll note, he teaches us this in chapter 11, saying that blood is for us. In, in, in 2 Corinthians, he said, we are made able ministers of the new covenant. 
meaning the blood aspect. And then in the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 12, it's there that he talks about the body, okay? For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, and note the last two words, last three words, by one spirit, last three words in the verse, into one spirit. Now, here's where I like to stop because almost anybody that I've ever talked to about this, they always say it, it's standard. I will say, well, into what spirit are we then baptized? And here's the standard answer. I'm telling you, I have never had anybody yet, except now you folks would do it, but you've heard it already. But the standard answer is, well, the Holy Spirit, huh, wait one minute. By one spirit, it's the Holy Spirit who's doing the baptizing. Here he is. We are baptized into one body and, last three uh, words rather, into one spirit. If Jesus Christ places the believer unto, under law into the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit places the believer under grace into whose spirit? Jesus Christ. That's the, um, you talk about why the Apostle Paul almost became Pentecostal when he, when he realized, my goodness, we're placed into the Son of God. We're placed into His spiritual entity. We're made to share. We're joint heirs with Christ. Before the foundation of the world, God the Father said, you are going to be heir of all things. Now, by the grace of God, He takes us, places us into Christ, and now we are joint heirs with Christ. Man, alive. You, you talk about something to throw at the mouth about, jump over the pews and, and get all excited. That's exciting. Doing it in a church service, so what? But actually understanding that you are made, you are made part and parcel with the very Son of God as He was before creation itself, as heir of all things to be made and, and, uh, and so forth. That's fantastic. So He takes this the believing sinner under grace and, and seals us into the body. Now, the di difference is this. This body is not outside of his deity. This body is inside of his deity. This body is placed into the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, in effect, takes us and places us into Jesus Christ. There's an absolute flip-flop or reversal of both. Okay. So now you get the connection. Here is water baptism, then spirit baptism. Here it's only spirit baptism. Eventually in the kingdom, it will be, it will be mainly uh, spirit baptism without the water. Okay, now let's just bring this to a close. Israel gets all aspects of the new covenant gathering out of the world to Israel being cleansed being born again given a new heart and a new spirit within but then a new spirit upon so they are saved and they are sanctified the Spirit is in them and poured out on them. Okay, now, how is that different with us? Well, because we are God's heavenly people, the mental rather than the physical is emphasized. With the Jew, it's always race, it's always body, it's always genealogy. It's always those things that are emphasized. But tell me, how far back can you go with your genealogy? You want to be like the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you trace it all the way back to Adam? I guarantee you he could. Why? Because with, with the new covenant and all the covenants of Israel, race was a priority. But when you're talking about the Gentiles, 
all that's a priority is are you saved? Whatever race you are, what difference does it make? If you're saved by grace and not by covenant, who cares what race you are? The important thing is, is are you saved? But now the, the, the dynamics are different. We would, we would say in them and now, through them. It's God the Holy Spirit who takes the mind of Christ here and applies it here. For them, he gives them the strength on them and causes them to keep the law. With us, it's more academic. And uh, that doesn't mean that from time to time your pastor cannot make some good point where you say, well, amen. <laughs> okay, I'll accept that. But it's different. Uh, it's different than in the services of the Pentecostals where they're trying to compete with the pastor about how loud they can get. That's why the pastor has to get down there with them if you've ever watched their show and begin yelling at them right in their face. He's got to yell at the top of his lungs. Why? Because he's competing with uh, their filling of the Holy Spirit and his filling of the Holy Spirit. And they yell and he yells louder. Nonsense. We're, we're, we're in a classroom where the, where the conditions are somewhat more controlled and more formal. Why? Because we emphasize the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ absolutely saturates us through the inner workings of the Holy Spirit. They have the outer workings of the Holy Spirit because all aspects of their earthly, physical, material blessings are involved in the new covenant. Ours are salvation, but then plus what grace gives us by way of spiritual blessings. And those spiritual blessings are spirit and truth, the mind of Christ.